Yeah, I'm always looking for people to uh, to audit my own thought process on things and help with um, uh, shifting my paradigm a little bit from where I where I've where I've come from and where I want to move towards. And so, like, I've had these conversations with Joe regularly about uh, in, interjecting, uh, you know, PRI based things with um, with fitness. Just not even PRI. It's just looking at like the body from this kind of like neuropulmonary, neuromechanical kind of lens mm -hmm. that I want that I want to move towards and understand more of. But I'm also a pragmatist, so I want to be as practical as I possibly can <laughs> within the context that I'm working. So that's always the challenge is like, how do we take this this information and then like make it as practical as possible? Yeah. Um, so and and I'll and I'll start with a confession first. And the confession is I don't I actually have a strong prejudice against PRI like clinical exercises. <laughs> I just don't like them in the context of what I do. And I'm not saying that they're bad exercises. It's either I'm not good at coaching them or I don't I don't get where they lead to from a terminal endpoint kind of thing. I don't know what that means to X in a movement in a movement scenario. Mm -hmm. And so what I've been trying to um, reconcile with myself is how do I how do I get uh, PRI objective tests changed potentially uh, with with other things in the gym, for example, um, which you've talked about a little bit too, um, or how or how can I, I at least identify some things that I either need to um, regress or refer out to, or how do I know when I've hit my key indicator to go to the next thing? Um, so these are the conversations I have. So that's like the overarching like general not very specific thing and then we can like start to feel it out from there right mm -hmm. um so you talked about like uh looking at variability as a training training construct mm -hmm. and so i'd like to get your thoughts on when in a training scheme would you pursue variability as a um, like a like a primary goal right like, so let's say we took a, a, a training program. Let's say we took a year training program. If we give a, like a particular specific context, like, so you would say maybe I'm going to work on restoring some variability in the off season for an athlete, for example, or another context could be, I'm going to try and restore some variability for a new person that comes to see me and they're really, really stuck and I want to see if I can restore some variability first before I pursue the power and capacity stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then what are your key performance indicators for that? You know, you mentioned in your podcast, like um, active mid stance tests, Copenhagen, you know, things of that nature. Um, and so I, for myself, from my own background, like I look at things historically, I've looked at things from a very like simple, almost mechanical or orthopedic kind of way like I'll assess clients I'll go through all of their joints independently and see can it do this or can it not and if I apply a, a local input like I have them do some isometric stretching activities or whatever it sometimes can create changes and that's good but it doesn't always stick and the thing that's been a game changer for me with looking at things through the PRI lens is addressing the respiratory stuff mm -hmm. so looking at rib cage and infrasternal angles has probably been the most helpful for me, especially with overhead, like restoring overhead motion, which is as, as like a personal trainer, like that's really valuable for me is like I can clear a lot of shit off the table because I don't have to yeah. do as much foam rolling or like isometric stretching or whatever. If I can just get somebody to feel their ribs, move them down and then start moving their arms overhead while they're anchoring. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been really powerful for me. So what's been great is I've been able to get rid of a lot of this stuff that I don't yeah. need anymore, yeah. but I want to continue on that path and, uh, and continue to kind of hone that in. Yeah. So become more efficient. I get it. Um, yeah. So now are we assuming you're not working with someone in pain? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because for me, that's when this, this variability stuff is primo. Got it. And it, it, in the setting that I work in currently, I only chase my objective testing insofar as they're pain free. And because eventually I want to give them the stuff you're doing, Charlie. Yeah. Yeah. Squat, hinge, push, pull, single leg, split, power, capacity. Yeah. And the sooner we can get them to that, the better. When you're looking at it from a training standpoint, because there was, 
with the product that I'm going to put out, there was a few people who I worked with who weren't necessarily in pain. And then it, you, you run the question is, okay, well, what, what is, what is the use of this variability stuff? Yeah. And it's really idiosyncratic to what extent you need to chase this with someone. Yeah. And what I would say is you need enough variability insofar as it allows you to use your entire movement menu of things you want to give to someone to help them meet their goals. Yeah. For example, let's say you have someone who can only squat a quarter of the depth and no matter how well you coach beyond that, it just is just not happening. Yeah. Well, maybe it behooves you then to see if you can eliminate variability as a potential rate limiting step in that equation. And so yeah. then you might chase down that pathway and then keep using your squat as your marker. Yeah. So right. that looks okay. Hey, you got you got deeper than you normally do. It still looks like ass, but you got mm -hmm. deeper than you normally do. Maybe we've gotten enough of this to where I can now coach you into the right position. Yes. That's that, that's also where I'm going to get at from, you know, talking about is the person in pain or not. That's still a valuable conversation to to be had, but I look at PRI as a way to improve a position or to understand what I'm not going to, why I shouldn't jam a bent nail into something that's just not going to go in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if they, if they're getting into a half kneeling stance and they can't get into their hip, so they're unleveling their pelvis because they can't adduct past midline. Like these are all valuable things that I want to be able to look and then be able to val validate with either a table test if I need to, mm -hmm. um, but start to look for activities where I can be like, can I, what can I use? to get them into a position or help them to feel a position if they have the patience to do it, or we, you know, we have the bandwidth to be able to start to do that. So, yeah. you know, um, and so the, the tests that I've been using, I'll just tell you is that have been most helpful is uh, looking at infrasternal angles, um, the adduction drop and the uh, shoulder internal rotation. Mm -hmm. And so those are the three I just kind of picked. Uh, and I try to keep it simple for myself, just collecting data and not even telling my clients what I'm doing. I'll just like, I'm just going to assess you, but I'm not going to tell you like, cause I don't really, if I don't really know what it means, I can't really tell you what we're going to do. Yet. I just want for my own edification. I want to start collecting and seeing patterns so that I could be more useful if, you know, and just see what changes, just start observing, you know, what we're doing. Is it actually changing or not? Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I don't do a lot of the other, the other tests and I don't know if I should or not. I just, I feel like those are the ones that I kind of picked out that would be a good place to start. What led you to make uh, those three in particular? Um, because, uh, messing around with like shoulder stuff, um, get, getting a rib, getting the ribs down has like changed shoulder flexion for so many people and changed IR for so many people. So that was my first, like aha moment mm -hmm. um and i've also seen people that uh, like i have some athletes for example that go in season they get really really uh worn down and those chest those tests change when they're under high stress situations mm -hmm. so that that was a quick one um, i had to get better at the adduction drop because um i think there's a little bit more setup involved with that for me um but that's probably the the most ambiguous test for me as far as like where, where, where it drives my decision making. Um, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So then Charlie, what, what do those three tests tell you individually? So yeah. like you see infrasternal angle presentation X. Yeah. What does that mean to you when you see a limited Ober's test or adduction drop or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. What does that mean to you when you see shoulder IR? Cause obviously you're seeing these things change. Yeah. But what is it assessing for you? Okay. I'll tell you what I think it means to me and you can kind of stuff it out from there. But I think the uh, Ober's, the Ober's test tells me how much it tells me the intrapubic angle and how much extension they're likely in. Could, could tell me two of those things. And I feel the same way about the IR. It tells me how much their, um, how much extension or extensor tone that they might be in. Um, and I'm just looking at it from a simple 
perspective. It just tells me what level of like stress they're under or whatever. Um, and I understand that like from the PRI perspective that uh, if they're lacking shoulder IR, it could tell you about rib cage positioning. Um, and so I, I kind of conceptually get that to a point. It, but to me, what the meaning is to me is maybe they need some more activities that get uh, some more rib control or a ZOA. And that's kind of where I, that's really where I stop, you know? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So a couple things. Um, I would argue that really all three of those tests are proxy measures for a, a phase of respiration. So there's a certain phase of rep respiration that's associated with a wide in theory talking the infrasternal angle, there's a certain phase of respiration that's associated with a narrow. Yeah. And secondary to what, what we think the diaphragm is doing. There's a certain phase of respiration that's associated with a limitation in IR versus ER, because I think that's another one that's important that you should probably consider checking. I'll explain why. Okay. Both of those have to do with location and have to do with the mechanics of the rib cage as you take a breath of air in versus out. Uh -huh. The Obers also tells you a little bit about respiration because we know that there are certain things that the axial skeleton does as you breathe in and out along with the rib cage. Okay. And if you have a limitation, because you could have a limitation in the Obers test or frontal plane adduction with both a wide and a narrow infrasternal angle. And if you're following the mechanics of, well, the, the reason why the obers is limited is because of an anteriorly tipped forwardly rotated hemipelvis. Yeah. Thank you. I, I've been yeah. struggling with this word this week and I don't know why. But, <laughs> um, like you can have a relative posteriorly rotated anominate, but because of what's going on at the axial skeleton, you can still have a limited obers. I think you mentioned that, and I don't really understand that, but I'll go with you on this. <laughs> I'll show you. And, and can I ask you one side question before yes, you continue? Sir. Is it always true that an infrasternal angle matches or, or can possibly tell you what an infrapubic angle is or not always? Could you have two different, could you have, a, for example, could you have a negative, well, I think I've seen it, like a wide infrasternal angle. Um, with a negative obers mm -hmm. could that be a possibility or so well here's what i would say to that i think that this would be purely theoretical but typically i would say the infrasternal and infrapubic angles could should match and they do match yeah because of what happens with the uh, pelvic floor, because of, it's, it's, it's a respiratory mechanism. But the reason why you are getting a, some people who have a negative obers coming in versus mm -hmm. a positive obers, despite the same angle presentation, has to do with what happens at the axial skeleton above. I'll give you an okay. example. Okay. So, how can I best do this? Okay. Sacrum. Hemipelvis, inominate. 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 Okay, so as the sacrum mutates, okay. that leads to a relative posterior rotation of the inominate. Okay. Okay. Of the opposite inominate. You both sides. SI okay. joint. Okay, okay, okay. But I'm just going to show you one side. So okay. I do this. And what we're just talking, because sometimes it's a lot easier to. To think about this in a bilateral sense. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I mutate or flex the sacrum, posterior rotation or extension of the nominate or the inlet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, you would reason to believe that if I did this, that would lead to a negative obers because you are able to clear the acetabulum. The if the sacrum is mutated, that's going to open up the posterior outlet. Because if this, if this rotates posteriorly, then the infrapubic angle has to be wider, right? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. the, the points on the top 
So if like these were my uh, ASIS right here, my, my pinkies, yeah. as I do this, as I extend, adduct, and internally rotate, these two get closer together. Right. And in the bottom, so you're in for cubic angle, as I flex, abduct, and externally rotate the outlet. It you get wider, wider, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, what happens if, as I nutate, what also goes on above the spine is an increase in lumbar lordosis? Okay. Okay? Yeah. Because increased nutation, increased, this is an exaggeration of the curve. Of, yeah. Because the spine exaggerates typically as a, under normal circumstances as a cohesive unit. Now, obviously, this is where it gets confusing because you can have people who hinge at particular segments blah 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 mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. but as the sacrum nutates the thorax increases in kyphosis the lumbar lordosis increases yeah exactly what if I to increase yeah. the lordosis well what's going to happen eventually is the sacrum though nutated faces this direction okay? yes so it's flatter well guess what even though this is posteriorly rotated if I have a lordotic, lordotic curve pulling me forward, then this appears like it's anteriorly tilted. Then you can have a positive oblique. And so what are, what are you saying that's potentially driving that? The lumbar lordosis is making it appear that way, and that's yeah. what gives you a negative test? Well, it gives you a positive test. I mean a positive test. That's what I meant. Correct. So okay. let, me, let, me, um, let me draw this. So see it again. I would show so how, you. Yeah, go ahead. So how, how would you isolate out the lumbar spine then to help? Or what, what other secondary tests could you use to, uh, to take that off the table if that was the case? You look at a, I don't think you do. I don't think you can. Okay. I don't think we can. What makes this really challenging is because how do I know it's the lumbar spine? It could be T12. Or it could be T11, T12 that they're hinging at. Right. All I know is we know normal mechanics, and if they're presenting in this fashion, we know that something has happened axially to do that. And, but really, mm -hmm. though, I don't think it, it impacts decision-making mm -hmm. either. It's like there are certain things based on what we know with the infrasternal angle because that's the one thing that can be pretty consistent. You know, regardless of how you try to, to um, compensate at the axial skeleton, mm -hmm. the one area that seems to be pretty consistent is the infrasternal angle. Like I can't do anything – in any transverse plane that will impact that. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with the yeah. constraints within those segments of the, the thoracic spine that correspond mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. Right. Okay, let, me, uh, let me draw this. So I'm a terrible drawer, but you can see this screen now, right? Oh, yeah. PNX Light. Download at pnxlight.com. So we have cervical lordosis. Thoracic lyphosis, lumbar lordosis, and then we have our sacrum. We'll say that's nutated, okay? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be a continuous like that. And then we'll say the, if, let's say this front portion is the front part of the pelvis, rotating back that way, okay? Okay. Based on this nutated position. If I were to increase the lordosis, let's say this is front. Oh, nope. Where's my drawing? There we go. Okay. Now, if I increase the lordosis, there's a simple way to do this. Slowly try to make them more lordonic, more lordonic. You see how the sacrum gets mutated. Guess what? Orientation of that F changes. So it looks like it's facing, it's tilted anteriorly, even though the relative motion of the, or the sacrum on the ilium is a posterior rotation, or the ilium on the sacrum, I should say. And so to accommodate to gravity, they would just increase the lordosis to get their center of mass over their base of support. Is that what you're saying here? Well, I, I, I can't say why that that happened. Okay. I'm just trying to conceptualize it up the chain because 
I, I, I think I know what you're saying at the pelvis level, but. Um, okay. Why, why is the increase in lordosis happening is what you're asking. Y y yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it's probably to manage. To, I mean, it, it's probably a combination of managing their environment. I mean, it's like all of, it's everything, right? It's genetics, epigenetics, the exposome. How do they best manage gravity? How do they best manage their environment? All their stressors in their life. I mean, we, we can't know why any of this is happening. Mars is in the third house of Jupiter, so yes, Mars Mars is in retrograde. A sacrum tilt. We know this. <laughs> <laughs> and then a butterfly uh, flaps its wings. And I, yeah, all right, all right. I only do certain exercises based on the lunar calendar, anyway. So this fits, <laughs> this fits with my paradigm. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You know what? I think you got yourself a commercial model there, Charlie. I do. I do. Well, stay tuned for lunartraining.com. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I might buy the domain name right now and sell it to you at a high price. Okay, good. <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> okay, so, uh, um, so that's Ober's test. Um, well, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you can't always rely on the over test. Then you're you're just you can't rely on visual inspection. But, you but you're saying, on. but you're saying it doesn't really change your your um, decision making either necessarily, right? Is that what you said? Correct. Because I'm always still going to address the infrastructural angle first. Yeah. Right. Okay. Because that, that's what I really that's think I should hone in on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because that's, I think that's really what I would like to hone in on is the is really kind of understanding infrastructural angles and and going. I think, would you think that's reasonable enough is to um, just keep going after that? I mean, that's kind of how I look at it in a fitness standpoint. Like for, for a long time, even before I found PRI, for me it was all about, you know, I, I took DNS courses years ago and we talked about the same thing, like rib centration and all this stuff, right? Um, but it's hugely powerful on the extremities. And you see that with people that are, that have good control and awareness of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, I think like if, if you had to pare it down to the bare bones, um, you have your two frontal plane measures, you have infrastructural angle and overs. Mm -hmm. you, can get, you can garner a lot of information from them. Yeah. Um, the treatment, Really what you're doing with the appendages in both of those cases is pretty much the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that I think about it. Okay. And with frontal plane activities, would you not put somebody in a frontal plane situation in the gym unless they could uh, achieve a, you know, a negative overs or a, or are you looking at abduction as well or, or not necessarily? Well, See, here's where I run into problems somewhat. Just because these tests are limited doesn't mean yeah. that they can't do what you ask. Doesn't mean they can't get in half kneeling or can't do a split squat. Right. I mean, you think about all the ways that, you know, when they try to wow you in a class or whatever and, and the ways that they've, they've made changes on tests. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, Lance Goyke is a prime example. I've gotten him to get full shoulder internal rotation by multiple different methods that had nothing to do with anything mechanically. Right. You know, um, I had him watch me breathe and then his IR was full. I, mean, I was just like. Neuro trickery. Yeah. Yeah. You got neuro trickery, but also, I mean, think about it this way. It's like, we're putting these people in these weird contrived positions in some cases and other cases not. Yeah. It's like, why, why couldn't it be that you put them in a given position yeah. or they just do something by accident or at that random and that could lead to some physical change in in testing that you may not know about based because the context was right yeah so what's to say that the reason why or your person can't get into a split squat despite having a positive overs mm -hmm. they could the the times in which i would say you're going to this stuff is if they can't do that and you can't coach them out of it right right so Chase fitness because that's what your your primary intent is, and that's why they're sure. paying you the big bucks. Uh, mm -hmm. But then you use this as a means to 
perhaps giving them options to build fitness that they may not be able to because variability is the rate limit step. Right. Right. Now, yeah. if you're chasing variability, if like we've decided that, Hey, we need to chase this for a little bit so we mm -hmm. can get you, get you a bigger menu to choose from. Mm -hmm. Then I think your exercise selection becomes a little bit different. Yeah. See, that's, that's interesting too, because I've thought about that too with, with conditioning. Like there's ways that, you know, like in a sporting context where you would taper and you get very specific to your needs. But of course, the higher you chase the peak of specificity, the more you start to lose general motor qualities, yeah. depending on the, depending on the sport, right? Like if you have a, something like powerlifting, which is highly sagittal and extension biased, um, you're going to limit your options further than somebody that was maybe a field sport athlete yes. that requires more multi-directional abilities or whatever. But my other question for you is, when you're looking at these tests, how are you reconciling that these passive, I'll call them passive, I mean, there's no such thing as passive, these tests, that, these table tests are actually going to have transference over to an activity for those high motor demands. Like you say, okay, oh, we recovered shoulder internal rotation by watching me breathe. And then you get them up on the table and they're doing a, a hang clean or something or power clean. How are you assuming that they're even going to have that? Uh, or what is your, what is your reasoning? Um, for, for that is it big, so they can get back to that when they're done because i've heard that stated too right like i want to make sure that you can get back to restoring ir or be at a position of rest when you're done with your activity you know yes <sighs> you're not gonna like my answer but my answer is i don't know yeah i mean that just like how do i know that let's use the let's use the power clean as an example yeah. How do I know that maybe let's say I can't get a change on the table. Yeah. How do I know that they're not making that change while they're power cleaning? Exactly. Yeah. I don't really yeah. like we, we don't. And I even would question like after spending some time in the league and just seeing like what these people can do mm -hmm. despite not having an adequate strength conditioning background. Like in transfer to anything, if like this is your terminal point, anything below that in terms of how much it transfers to your terminal point is entirely yeah. democratic. Yeah. Yeah. What, what we're hoping is how, if this is the terminal point, can we bridge that gap at, at each way? And it's like, I don't know where, like if this is point G, where point F is. Right. But, but I, what I see more commonly is moving from the clinical to the performance world is clinical A, performance Q, you know what I mean? Like, or Z, you're like, there's, there's, and then there's no, there's no grading up of the continuum from a low level, low, you know, low load motor control based exercise up to a power capacity exercise. Like there's a, there's a gap usually there where you're scaling it up. Right. Which is where the whole, progression regression thing is so important right like yes how do you how do you go from um you know a, a sideline drill and then move it up to a tennis player doing a rotational you know forehand or whatever it is right like where where is your where's your thought process lead you is you're doing this exercise for lateral chain stability let's say and then you need some lateral chain stability in a high stress environment with your full body weight, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, how do you bridge that? Gap? How do you bridge that gap? Yeah. Do you need to bridge that gap? Uh, maybe. maybe. Well, yeah. I, well, because here's what I would say: like, if we're, we're a definite, doing, maybe. Yes. <laughs> because can you not bridge the gap by just making sure you manipulate volume and intensity in such a manner that you don't potentially put that person at in harm's way by doing right. terminal exercise. Right. Like I right. could, like you, that, that is a reasonable progression. It's like, okay, you did this sideline activity and we got what we wanted out of it, whatever we're measuring. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, let's, let's just see if we can, we can kick it up a notch. I'm a Lagasse style and see if you can do this, this more challenging activity. And then we're just careful with how, how well we dose that. But do yeah. you need to, do you need to go from, sideline to 
quadruped and then I need to go to the low right. position and then I got to go to tall knee and a half. I don't know. Like yeah. I, when I'm, when I'm coaching someone, I want to get them to the big bad boys as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. And I almost, the way I approach it is I'll go to that. And then if they can't do that, I need to supplement it with something a little bit lower level to help mm -hmm. basically build it up. Sure. I think it's actually easier to do in a gym environment where you're doing, you know, um, closed chain activities or your closed environment activities where there's not, you're not reacting to somebody on the soccer field coming at you and you're having to, yeah. you know, react. Whereas like you, if you're lifting a weight, it's a dead piece of weight. And yes. so it's a little easier in that context versus having to deal with an, an MMA fighter that, you know, has to, wants to rip your throat react and change yeah it's a high stress environment it's it's highly variable there's yeah. you know where, where something in a gym would be a little, little easier so for sure well and that's like with me in that guy's case i don't know how well what we do does transfer to that because it's yeah. like we can never we can never produce that degree of chaos that degree of uncertainty and that degree of force production with anything we do in a gym yeah. You know, what, what, what's the statistic is every time you take a, like running, for example, every time you take a step and mm -hmm. on a run, it's like eight times your body weight. Yeah. Right. Or sprinting, right? It's like sprinting. Yeah. That's what it was. It was sprinting. Yeah, eight, eight, eight or nine times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a substantial amount. And then, well, what if you also have a 300 pound lineman who's trying to, yeah. you know, eat you while you're doing that? It's like, you just like, there's nothing we can do in the gym that, that can, create that transfer. Like I, I think what would be a cool scenario for me is if you work together with a sport coach to like what I was doing a little bit. And when I was in Iowa in the D league, me and this, one of the sport coaches got along swimmingly and he taught me so much about just basketball skill sets. And like we had a couple of return to play people we worked with where it's like, Hey man, what skills does he need to work on? And then I would dose the volume and intensity. Mm. And then like if he had a technical fault with something that was general quality. So for example, let's say um, I had one guy who could not shuffle, like he was, he had a foot, a foot surgery and he could not do a push off into a lateral shuffle off of his right foot. And so it's like, Hey Joe, that was the coach, coach Boylan. Um, I need this guy to be put in as many positions as possible where he's doing this. What do you got? And then, like, do that with the ball. See if we can get him to do that as much as possible. Hey, he's having a hard time doing that. Then I take – I step in and say, hey, let's just – like, this is what I want. And then I, I like, I act as, as the strength conditioning coach in that sense. And then we immediately put him back in the situation that he's trying to, to perform at a high level. With. Like, to me, that's where you would get transferred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. For, for an MMA guy. So like if you're working with an MMA cat, like maybe you are the guy who's helping manipulate volume and intensity within the, um, the drills that would potentially transfer to fights or what most, would most likely have the biggest transfer aside from fighting itself is sparring, right? I, I mean, we even question how much sparring transfers to, you know, the fight in Vegas. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like maybe you can play a role in that and saying, hey, we're going to do these kind of rounds because it matches the energy systems that are needed for fight night. And we're going to do all these things. And if you see something sparring that like, oh, OK, this I need to go strength coach him at some point, either. I mean, probably not within the sparring session, but like right after to kind of reinforce that. Like to me, I think that's when you have the best fighting chance of, of transfer to someone like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it depends on the context of the the of their year too in regards to their training like if you're if you're as far away as possible from their competitive season there might be some more things you can do there versus maybe the before the maybe yeah just but, trying to think again too, I'll in the to it. like why are you doing that besides just giving them a breather from their task Right, right. Which Getting is not wrong, I'm, but I mean, yeah. it's just like it's it's almost like an existential crisis I have with our profession. Yeah, yeah. It's like when do we matter? Right. For an athlete, we, we want to feel useful. 
right? right. We, we want to earn the money too in, the, in our, yeah. our professional sports. I get it. I, I was thinking about this with, you know, with the, the whole functional training thing that's gone on the last 15 or whatever years and all these activation exercises and activation drills. And then when you strip all those away and you're like, well, what, if you don't have those in an hour long session, what do you do with people? Mm-hmm. And the answer is you do more fitness things, <laughs> yes. which is, which is really what we should be doing anyway. It's like, okay. why aren't, why are you're either, you're either creating, you're teaching somebody how to move better or maybe differently than what they had been doing, mm-hmm. or you're increasing skills that they already have by increasing load, speed, complexity, endurance, right? And so to me, like activation exercises are either, I don't know what they're doing other than are you bringing their awareness to an area that they might have not sensed that will funnel into the skill that they want to get better at. So I can see those exercises being useful in regards, maybe in in regards to helping them find an area that they might not have awareness of, but if they don't have awareness of it, it doesn't matter anyway. It's not just going to magically turn on or off. Like I don't, I don't even know what that means. Like turning on or off a muscle. Well, and muscles don't turn on or off. I mean, they're always. They're not, it's not a switch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. This me- mechanistic view of what the body is. It's like you're either informing an awareness of an area, or you're getting after it. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. you probably justify too. I mean, just as a general warm up too. I mean, by doing some of these low level things, you're probably increasing local circulation and all this. Yeah. But. yeah. I, I had a conversation, I think it was on strengthcoach.com. I actually just posted something about glute activation and we were talking about like, why are we so obsessed with butts all the time? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, and I think the consensus just came out to be like, well, maybe it's just a way of creating a dissociation between a spine and hip extension, if that's your goal. So we might be able to look at it from that perspective. Uh, where some people just don't have any awareness about how to separate the two. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could maybe you could argue that these glute bridges that you're doing pre-workout would help them to feel hip extension with less back extension, for example. But when? <laughs> and then right. what, like context again, it comes back to context. It's like when okay, right. it's gonna happen. Yeah. Right. It's gonna happen in the deadlift. I don't know. The knee position is different. Right. Is that right. right? And are you, and are you training the glutes in hip extension or are you training it, training them in hip flexion or in rotation or, or whatever? So, yeah. Yeah. I have to mimic, I have to, I have to get closer to the activity that you, I think you're trying to, to work on, you know? Yeah. As opposed to saying working the glutes as in there's only one way to work the glutes, which is concentrically in a sagittal plane fashion. Yes. Because they don't yeah. do things in other planes. Right, ever. We're, we're gingerbread men. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeed. In, in, the, in the context of a training environment, if you're using um, like an activity to create awareness, like let's say you have somebody getting into a, a position where you want them to feel muscles, right? Um, I could see that being a useful tool pre-workout. Like I want you to feel these muscles first. And then we're going to use that and I'm going to continue that conversation as we saunter over to the barbell and talk about deadlift. Mm-hmm. So, that, so I could see that as being a useful tool um, or some of these breathing based activities uh, could be used in an off day scenario where you're like, I, I'd like you to try and practice these things as a way of feeling and sensing muscles or feeling and sensing air in certain chambers of your body <laughs> you know, to create stability for deadlifting or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's where I could, that's where I, in my own mind, that's where I rationalize the utility of some of these drills is as, mm-hmm. as a way to facilitate um, linking pieces together in a coordinated fashion, not assuming that it's going to transfer, but assuming that at least we have some raw materials to engender awareness so that they can go over and hopefully transfer that in the activity itself. That's fair. Is that fair? Yeah, so fair. So fair. Okay. Thanks for confirming my biases. That's yeah. <laughs> what I'm here for. Yeah. All right. That's what I'm here for, Charlie. Yeah. I feel the same way about like the DNF canon of exercises. It's uh it's just a way of getting into a position and feeling a chain of muscles 
that you can hopefully transfer to another activity mm-hmm. as opposed to doing a side clam for a hip, a side bridge for, a, for an ab and external rotations for a shoulder. Well, if I get you into a side support and oblique sit and have you rotate around those two points, you're going to get all three of those things. And it's likely going to transfer over more to maybe single leg stance activities than doing all three of those concentric based exercises. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. That's probably very idiotic. Yeah. Because you could say that this might transfer more for one person, but another person may be. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. I don't know. I don't have a good yeah. answer. Yeah. Like, like, like the most non answers, non answer yeah. session in the history. Of the <laughs> that's good, though. I mean, I don't think we said, I don't know. No. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It, it's, I mean, a lot of the stuff is just like, it's like, um, it's like Western Feldenkrais in a way. You know what I mean? Westernized Feldenkrais. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I'm looking at it. That's right. I think too, it's almost like a, it's almost like getting our people to meditate to an extent as well as you're, it's essentially building some awareness, maybe some focus, but Hey, I really need you to think about feeling this. And, you know, especially this day and age where we cannot focus tension spans are dwindling. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe a lot of this stuff is also just a good way to get someone into a certain frame of mind that you need them in to be able to, Right. The terminal moves that you need them to do. Right. Yeah. Well, that would be, I mean, that would be an ideal scenario if somebody actually spent some time to cultivate some inner awareness, you know? Yes. Which is the battle, the, the battle that I think people have in fitness is where you're in an environment where you have um, loud, it's a loud space, you're usually loud music, and you're trying to facilitate a learning experience in an environment that isn't always conducive for people to learn. Yes. Uh, you know, yes, uh, something to consider. Uh, not that I don't mind, you know, hard rock music blasting very loudly when I'm trying to deadlift something that's helpful, usually. Yeah, for sure. Probably yeah. not when you're trying to find and feel particular areas or with meditation. Right. Right. Yeah. So, meditation's the answer. Good job. Always. Man. Yeah. Not always. I, I think if you had to pick something, I'd pick sleep first. Yeah. yeah. Sleep first, nutrition. Yeah. And then I probably would go movement than meditation. That's because I'm biased because I like movement. I want to keep my job. I had a very good meditation teacher, meditation teacher tell me that uh, you should find a way, a level of mindfulness that you are, you are, that you gel with and then start branching out from there. Like pe- people that are movement people, should do some kind of movement mindfulness and then but eventually find you're going to find value in the things that you're not good at like a sitting sitting meditation or something yes well don't you think when you're deadlifting heavy weight assuming you don't get too amped up that's meditative in extent if you're just within the moment for a rep depends on how heavy it is i guess (laughs) yeah but i mean like i mean think about like your traditional bodybuilding workouts Bodybuilding is different, though, I think, from a... Yeah, that's true. Bo- bodybuilding, I think, is highly, like, interoceptive. If people, I, and I think bodybuilding, I think some elements of bodybuilding would be, could be very useful for people for a lot of different reasons. But one of them is bodybuilders are really all about mind-muscle connection and feeling and sensing things. And it's also a very simple single-joint activity. Mm-hmm. that you can really feel and also people can work and get a really good burn and get a really good workout um and uh they can learn something about anatomy through bodybuilding really easily oh yeah want to use it as, as a teaching tool for that yeah um yeah build, build some local muscular endurance mm-hmm. i think it's great i think people bash bodybuilders too much i think bodybuilders and who knows more about manipulating nutrition than a bodybuilder okay like that's like all they do <laughs> yeah. Central. Right. You can bash bodybuilders all they want, but uh, we had one bodybuilder who again became a millionaire before he was a movie star and then took over the movie world and then became a governor of uh, the state of California. So that's right. That's right. Bash them all you want, but I haven't heard a power lifter do that. I haven't heard a functional 
movement person do that. I've never heard anyone do that. That's right. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe you'll be the first, Charlie. Do you understand the uh, the stuff regarding the like the testing and like do you know where to go with some of this stuff? I'm sure Joe's talked to you about some of it, but he's also kind of just getting into the ISA a little bit. Yeah, he says he he's like he he wants to dig deeper into the infrastructural angle stuff, and he says he's he still needs to sit down and and research and hash out how he wants to present it. So he's a little hesitant on what he wants to tell me about it, I guess. Present so, it so. He's, he wants to do some research and do a whole presentation on on rib mechanics and things like that. This is what he told me last time I saw him. And um, so I don't know what that means. But uh, yeah, yeah. But um, as far as what to do, like I have my go-tos for um, and this is what I talk with him about. I'm like, here's my, here's what my theoretical progressions for restoring shoulder flexion. So I would like to get people to be able to bring their arms overhead. That would be a useful thing to do. Um, or things to improve hip extension or hip internal rotation. Or things that allow them to get deeper into a squat. So everything for me is funneled into how is it going to improve somebody's ability to get into a position to load. Um, I'm not looking at pain. I'm not looking at you know, um, whatever I'm looking at, does it allow me to facilitate a position to train in? Um, and so I have my go-tos and my list is very small, but I'd like to keep adding on to that as I see things change. You know? yeah, me too. I mean, if, yeah, long if I need... things that work, like I have a few moves that I do with, you know, okay, if you are a narrow, you are likely going to get one of five moves. If you're a wide, you're going to get likely of one of four or five moves. Yeah, and then it's just like you have these baselines, and then you branch out from there, depending on what the other testing looks like. Right. Or someone who's got limited IR, and based on where they went from the ISA, it's like they're probably either going to do this or this, or yeah. ER or whatever. Yeah, I don't think you need much. You need stuff that works. Mm -hmm. Have you messed around with any handstand stuff at all? Personally, yeah. Um, I haven't been handstanding in a while because I got lazy with it. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, I do it. I've yeah. done it. I can only support myself on a wall. I do a version called an L handstand where your feet, these are your feet, they're on a box and your torso is like this. So you're not fully up. Mm -hmm. And it you know, posteriorly rotates the pelvis. And a lot. It helps, it helps to um, brilliant. keep ribs down. And I'm working on that with some PME and also getting people to um, it's it just, it's a better version of a handstand for most people because they're not going to just overextend most of the time. And, uh, and also I think it helps ascend the diaphragm by pushing the visceral content down in this case towards their head, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and I say that because as a wide infrasternal angle person myself, nothing has changed my upper body and shoulders more than handstand work. And, uh, and I've had some people who've had shoulder flexion. I have a long distance swimmer right now I'm working with and a triathlete. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, I have them do handstand work, regression work with that. Mm -hmm. And their shoulder flexion stuff seems to stick better. And my theory is that it is, facilitating a lot of things but also because the handstand is a high more uh it's a higher neural demand you're putting more body weight on your hands mm -hmm. like it just creates a more potent stimulus to the body than doing some open chain all these like again this goes back to like these little corrective exercises like the wise tws reach roll and lift all this other shit it just i've never seen it work so i just abandoned it and i'm like get into a handstand i don't know why you just let, let's figure out a way to get you to that because that to me is more of a terminal end exercise for shoulder flexion than, uh, you know, uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the changes seem to stick and, and they seem to last longer when I do activities or if they're healthy enough to get to that, then I, that's where I push. Yes. And I don't like the open chain variations because they, it's, I think it's harder for them at first to control a rib in free space with an open chain implement like a overhead carry or a Turkish get up or something like that. I'd rather have them. 
the pullovers. Like a kettlebell pullover. Oh, I love those. So that's one of my progressions that I use for shoulder flexions, like a hook lying T8 style pullover. Um, and I do a lot of the hanging work after we do the pullover stuff, if I can see they control their rib cage there. And I've been playing around with different hanging variations, which has been awesome. Like hanging is by far the best shoulder activity that I've seen that if they can do it, you know? Yeah. Big fan. Uh, Big fan of hangs. Yeah. But that's cleared off a lot of having to stretch a lot of things by just doing those two things. Well, and if you can choose intense variations, I mean, the body has to respond somehow to it. Right. Right. Um, so I like that handstand variation sounds awesome. I wish it was appropriate for my people, but yeah. you know, my people don't eat vegetables. Right. Well, and I also, again, I can use fitness activities to change positioning. Yes. They're getting a sweat. It's hard and they love it. Um, they get some appreciable fitness out of it. And, and if they wanted to do things like overhead pressing and whatnot, if you can do a handstand, your support function in your upper body is rock solid at that point to me. No you know? Yeah. And, I, and talking with friends of mine that, that participate in some of these gymnastics based activities, which is how a lot of our general physical prep was, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. Like a lot of our physical, physical education was born out of Swedish gymnastics and dance. Um, and we just, for some reason, we got away from that, that physical literacy that came from gymnastic based conditioning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my friends that I talked to that do this kind of stuff, the strength elements that they get in gymnastics seems to carry over to many more things than like traditional strength activities, barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells. Um, it carries over to more of those things, whereas the other ones don't necessarily inform the gymnastic skills because gymnastics seems to be a really powerful CNS intensive activity. And also strength is always paired with coordination and mobility. They're never separate. They're always trained together. Yeah. Um, and so when I look at that as an activity, I'm like, well, it just gives you way more things. It's like the Marine Corps boot camp of, of physical prep. Like if you go through that, if you go through Marine Corps boot camp, you can go to any other branch of the service, but you can't say the same thing for the others, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so I've just found over the years that that seems to be a better way to go. And also they emphasize a lot of flexion based activities before extension. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I call it going to, uh, you got to go to flexion school before you get a job in extensionville. And that's what gyms do. I like that. Right. Get your, before you get your PhD in extension, you got to, you got to learn some flexion, some okay. tummy time for adults. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Whereas like you go, to, you go straight to a barbell, you can just extend the hell out of it and get the, get the thing done. But the way gymnastic skills work is if you, if you aren't, if you aren't in a more ideal position, you're probably not going to be able to do the skill. Like you do, you try to do a front lever and not have all of this on good luck. Like it's, you're just going to fall and look like an idiot. <laughs> you know what I mean? What I do every Wednesday when I do my front lever progression. Yeah. Right. <laughs> just fall on the ground. <laughs> it's the. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> so it's called, you, you just work on building the glue. So you get to the sticking point, you hold, and then just curl it on the way down. That's pretty much what I'm doing. But the holes, Good. you know, I've probably got, like, I can probably make it to 2 o'clock. Yep. From complete yep. upside down. Yeah. Um, and hold that. Yeah. And then it's just, you know, as soon as I hit to about 3, it's fall. Yeah. Yep. But that's better than what I could do, which was nothing. Well, if you get the progressions online, you'll see that there's 22 progressions and regressions. And, uh, so, yeah. And what's amazing is doing the lower level regressions can actually inform the, the skill. Speaking of transference, mm -hmm. if, you, if you do some of the lower level things, you, you may be surprised to see how that actually helps the higher level stuff. Interesting. Doing simple things like a hollow rock can help a front lever if you haven't built some time on doing just basic hollow rock. Hmm. Yeah. I never would guess that. Yeah. That just flies in the face of everything we talked about. It, 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 not, necessarily. not necessarily. For some people, though, it might. But maybe it does. Some people. Yeah. But again, we were also talking about open environments versus closed environments and how if you're doing a controlled strength skill in gymnastics, it's a little different than if you're like you know, flipping in the air. Like that We can't say that like doing acrobatics is going to, you know, some of like hollow rocks are going to help acrobatics necessarily because that's yeah. a much more complex motor task. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah.